Hey everyone, I'm Mr. A, and today I want to talk with you about Newton's Law of Heating and Cooling. Before I get into this, I want to let you know this is going to be just a simple introduction. This is not a calculus level video, although I'll probably do one of those at some point. This is a topic that you'll run into in pre-cal courses, so I'm going to give you a general overview, show you how it works and how we can use it, and give you a sense of what's going on behind the scenes. But when you get to calculus, AP calculus, or that level of course, you'll see where this actually comes from and be able to derive the formula. It's a pretty cool bit of mathematics. To get into Newton's Law of Cooling, we're going to start with a simpler formula that you've likely seen before, exponential growth and decay. So this comes up in science classes. You'll also see it in a lot of algebra classes. If you have something that's growing or decaying, the amount you're going to have after some period of time is just whatever you started with times e, that special number, to the RT, where R is the rate and T is the time. Now this works really well for simple problems. Uh, it works especially well for decay, but the, we run into some problems when we try to apply this to the natural world. A classic example is bacteria in a petri dish. So we've got one bacterium there, and then we've got two in the dish, and then we have four in the dish, and eight, and 16, and 32. So for a while, this works just fine. At some point, the dish starts to get really full. We run out of space, so this formula a equals p times e to the rt. This works great in an unbounded situation. So it's what we call unbounded growth, right? So we can grow as long as we want and go as high as we want. Now this works really well for something like money. But if we're talking about bacterium in a bowl or any other kind of natural phenomenon, there's a finite amount of space, right? Even if you consider this petri dish to be the entire universe, at some point you'll run out of space. So what would a more realistic expectation look like? Let's say we had a graph and we're going to graph the population of bacteria over time. And so as time goes on, we're going to have more bacteria, of course, but there's some finite amount of space in this bowl. Let's say that that's this line here, that no matter what happens, like that's the maximum amount of bacteria that'll fit into that Petri dish. So what are we going to expect to happen here? Well, certainly the bacteria are going to grow, right? They're going, but we have to have them kind of leveling off here. Now, if you think about the slope of the regular exponential curve, you can see that we're going to be a problem. If we just do P times E to the RT, this thing gets steeper and steeper and it's going to pierce that line, but we can't have that happen. So what we need instead is a curve that's going to be leveling off like this. It's going to get closer and closer to that line, but eventually become asymptotic to it. So we're never going to exceed that amount of bacteria in the Petri dish. This is the type of growth that we're going to look at today, and this is what we get with something called Newton's Law of Heating and Cooling. So let me show you what the equation looks like. Let me break down these different components for you. So this is just going to be the temperature that you have at some period of time. It's a little bit confusing that we use capital T's and lowercase t's, so just be aware that those are different. The lowercase t is the actual time as that you're entering. That's your independent variable. T is the output, the temperature after a certain amount of time. T sub s, this is the surrounding temperature. So s for a surrounding. You'll also see this called the ambient temperature sometimes. That's the temperature of the room or the vessel that something is heating or cooling inside. For example, an oven or a freezer. This one, T sub zero or T naught, is the initial temperature, right? So that's the temperature that the object is at initially. If you're taking, say, cookies out of the oven, that would be a high temperature. If you are taking something out of the freezer, that would be a low temperature. And then T sub S appears once again here. That's the surrounding temperature. There's that E. There's that lowercase T, which is just time again. So this K over here, this is a constant that has to do with how fast the rate of cooling or heating is. And we're going to actually need to solve for that. And when we do, you'll see this k is very sensitive. We're going to need to pay attention to a lot of decimals here. But let me just give you a sense of what's happening in this formula. So what this is saying is that if you want to know what the temperature of the object is, you start off with what the temperature of the surrounding area is. So let's say we're heating up cookies in an oven. The oven is going to be hot. Right, The cookies are going to be cooler than the oven because we're cooking them in the oven. So this will be a higher number than our cookies. Now T sub zero, the initial temperature, that's our cookies. That would be cool in this case. So this term here is the difference between the initial temperature and the surrounding temperatures. Take a moment to realize that that difference is going to be constant, right? I mean, you start at some amount, at some temperature, and the surrounding area is some other temperature. They're never going to change. One of the assumptions with Newton's law of heating cooling is that the surrounding temperature is held constant. So if you're heating up in an oven, let's say, or if you're cooling down in a freezer, the temperature of the oven or of the freezer remains constant. 
that means that this difference is a constant difference. But that tells us something about what has to happen to this e to the kt over here, right? If you think about what the graph looks like of e to the kt, normally you would probably imagine this type of a thing. But that's only true if k is greater than 0. So this k is going to have to be negative. This is not the type of graph that we're looking at for this problem. What we're going to be looking at is something where the e to the kt looks like this. It starts off at 0, 1, and it is decaying. Right, so this is what that graph looks like when k is less than 0. In other words, that's going to always be a negative k. That's really important because what happens then is as time goes on, you can see that this e to the kt term is going to 0. Right, so it starts off at 1, and as time goes on, it decays to essentially 0. And what that does is it gradually kills this term here. Right, so this equation is saying take the temperature of the surrounding and add this difference to it, be it positive or negative, in the case where we have something that's in a hot room and it's cold when we put it in, right? So we want this to raise up to this temperature. The way that works is this difference is negative to start with. So we're going to add initially a whole lot of negative. That whole difference gets added to the surrounding temperature, which brings the equation all the way down to the temperature of the cookies. But as this term crunches to zero, right, as we move along this graph, and that e to the kt goes smaller and smaller, it's adding less and less of this difference, which in this case is to say it's subtracting less and less of this difference from the surrounding temperature. So as we go forward in time, this entire term vanishes and we're just left with the surrounding temperature. So really all this is, it's an exponential decay where what's decaying is how much of this difference is still present. And in the end, none of this difference is present and we're left with just the surrounding temperature of the room. So if we were to graph that, what we end up with is something that looks like this. Let's say our temperature of the surrounding was up here. This is our oven temperature and we're starting off down here at our cool cookie temperature. Initially they're down here, but as time goes on what happens is they warm up towards that temperature of the oven. And we get this asymptotic behavior because as time goes on, this e to the kt is getting crunched to zero, which is killing this entire term. So this function is just going to become t sub s, that surrounding temperature. Let's say we have a fresh batch of cookies and they just came out of a 350 degree oven. So these cookies are hot. We're gonna to wanna to cool them down. So we're gonna place them on the counter to cool in a room whose ambient temperature is 70 degrees. That is our T sub S. After five minutes, the cookies have cooled to 250 degrees. That means that T of five is 250. What we wanna know is how long is it gonna take for the cookies to cool to a comfortable 125 degrees for eating? T of T, right, equals 125, and this is what we're trying to solve for, little t, that independent variable. Now let's just go to this equation for a moment and think, t of s, t sub s we know, that's the temperature surrounding 70, t initial we know, that is the uh, 350, right, that's because they came out of that oven, so we're going to assume they are that temperature, so we know t sub 0, we know t sub s, e of course we know what that is, that's little t which we're going to solve for, but notice that we do not know what k is. So the first thing we need to do is figure out what k is for this particular situation. And the way that we do that is with this piece of information. So we can take t sub 5 or t of 5 equals 250 and turn that into the following equation. 250 equals temperature of the surrounding, which is 70, plus temperature initial, that's 350, minus temperature of the surrounding, that's that 70 again, times e to the k5. If we simplify this a little bit, what do we get? 250 equals 70 plus 280e to the 5. If you remember before, we said that this k is going to have to be negative. Here again, you can see why. We're going to want to chip away at this 280 that's being added to the 70 so that it works itself down to the room temperature of 70. So we'll take 70 away from both sides here. So 250 take away 70, that'll get us to 180. It'll be equal to 280e to the 5k. We want to get to that k, so we're going to use logs, specifically natural logs, because we have an e as the base. We'll first divide both sides by 280. So we have 180 over 280, and it would be equal to e to the 5k. And at this point, I'll take the natural log of both sides. It would give me 5k is equal to the ln of 180 over 280. k equals 1 fifth times the ln of 180 over 280. Now, plugging that into our calculator, you're going to get approximately 
negative point zero eight eight three six six five five zero five. Here's the thing, that K is pretty sensitive. So not always, but oftentimes in these problems, that K is sensitive enough that even going three or four decimal places just isn't enough to guarantee that you have the correct answer. So I will just store that in my calculator as X so I can use it later. So I just took a minute to clean up my workspace there. Now that we know this value of K, we can go back to the original question and just figure out when is this gonna be 125? So I start off by saying, all right, I want the temperature to be 125. That's not a variable anymore, that K. We know what it is. I'm just not going to write that whole number in the exponent. It's stored in my calculator. 55, 280, e to the KT. e to the KT is equal to 55 over 280. So I get KT is equal to the ln of 55 over 280. T is just 1 over K times the ln of 55 over 280. 18.417. So we're going to have to wait just about 18 and a half minutes to eat these cookies. So that was an example of an object cooling down. Let's just take a look at an example of an object heating up. So this time, perhaps we're cooking a pot roast. We're going to have to figure out what these different numbers are. So 350, that's our T sub S. 60 is the initial temperature, and it rises to a temperature of 70 degrees after the first 10 minutes. That means that big T of 10 is 70. That's where we're going to start this problem because that will let us plug everything into here except for K so we can solve for K. 70 equal to 350, 60 minus 350 times E to the KT. It's K times 10, which is 10K. And I want to solve for K. Negative 280, so negative 290 E to the 10K. We're going to divide both sides by 290, so we have negative 280 is equal to E to the 10K. Taking the log of both sides, k one tenth natural log of 28 over 29. 0, 0, 3, 5, 0, 9, 1, 3, 2. And now that I know the value of k, I'm just going to plug into the original equation. So my goal here is to get to 145 degrees. And then I'm just going to do a little bit of algebra. Let's just call that about 99. So we're gonna have to wait about an hour and 39 minutes for this roast to be ready in the oven. So just a quick recap of what we talked about here. Exponential growth and decay, this is a basic formula and it works perfect for money, works great for things that are decaying because there's this natural floor at zero, but for growth it gets a little wonky if you try to apply it to the real world. It works for a little while, as long as the thing that's growing has plenty of room to expand and be happy, but when you start to run up on some constraints, then this starts to run into a problem because it wants things to grow forever and that's an issue because there's not enough space in the universe so this is a problem so the way newton's law of heating and cooling resolves this issue is by taking this difference in the temperature that you're trying to get to and the temperature that you start off at and multiplying that by this ever decreasing exponential decay piece over here so what this looks like in practice is there's some temperature that your surrounding area is, right? So this is the T sub S. And if you start off higher than that, at some hot initial temperature, then you're just going to kind of cool down towards that line. And then if you start at a cooler temperature, right? So if you had a temperature initially down here, then you're going to, of course, warm up and you're gonna, again, trend towards that line. Notice that in both of these cases, I'm warming up faster in the beginning, and then as time goes on, I'm warming up slower and slower and slower. Same here. I'm cooling down much more in the beginning than I am as time goes on. I'm cooling down slower and slower and slower. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to my channel, feel free to leave a comment below, and as always, have a great day.